Even the greats make mistakes. The best football managers in history such as Alex Ferguson and Jose Mourinho have had tactical blunders. Lionel Messi, Roger Federer, Wayne Gretzky, Ronnie O'Sullivan and Tom Brady have all had games or matches where they've played badly. And the same thing happens in Formula 1 and other forms of motorsport. Even the best have off days. Schumacher sliding into the wall at Lower Mirabeau during the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix. Hamilton and his brake magic switch. Colin McRae mishearing a call during the 2001 RAC rally. It happens on the track and off the track as well, as even the biggest brains in motorsport have moments of when they get it wrong. And this is what happened with Adrian Newey, Williams and the FW16. The FW16 was born at a time when Formula 1 was in the midst of a reset. During the 1993 season, every single car with the exception of the Scuderia Italia team had some sort of driver aid on board. Whether that was anti-lock brakes, traction control, automatic gearboxes, and in the case of the FW15C, which was run by Williams, yes. But at the Canadian Grand Prix, new president Max Mosley announced the effective end of the 1993 season, every single one of those driver aids with the exception of power steering and flappy paddle sequential gearboxes would be banned. The fear being that not only were the drivers becoming secondary parties in the racing of these cars, there were fears that if any of the software on board became corrupted or bugged or stuff like that, then there could be a massive accident. In reality though, part of it was due to the special relationship between Ferrari and the FIA. While Williams and McLaren had got active suspension worked out, Ferrari couldn't get theirs to work. Berger's car unceremoniously slammed itself onto the ground at Barcelona and just after this, Ferrari spoke to the FIA and the FIA invoked Article 3.15, the one I've referenced several times in these videos about bodywork being rigid to the sprung part of the car or whatever it is. Something that I'm sure Adrian Newey, Aldo Costa and guys like that can reel off without even needing to look it up. As active suspension was now going out of the window, so was everything else, including the CVT that Williams had been working on which Ferrari also took exception to. So for Williams, it was back to the drawing board. They were the pioneers of the active age. They were not the inventors of sequential gearboxes because Ferrari had done that in 1989. They weren't the inventors of active suspension because Lotus had tried it before, also in the 80s, but they were certainly the ones that got them working to a point where they were a viable option to use on a car. The FW15C to this day is still the most advanced Formula 1 car in history. If it had been a more aggressive driver at the wheel such as Senna or Mansell, it probably could have been as dominant as the MP44, but that's just pure speculation. Aggressive drivers did seem to do better with these active cars though. At the beginning of 1994, Williams launched the FW16, a car that was launched in a brand new colour scheme for the team. Gone was the yellow of Camel cigarettes and in was the more regal looking Rothmans tobacco colours, a colour scheme that was one of the first sporting memories that I have. Now, driving it was three-time champion Ayrton Senna and the son of the only man to complete the Triple Crown, Damon Hill. Once again, Damon was running the number zero on his car, as only the champion is allowed to carry the number one. Because Prost, like Mansell before him, had retired upon winning the championship, Williams was unable to use one and two. So Senna, the new driver to the team, was given two, and Hill, who was already there, was given zero. The only man to race with the number zero. If the old system of numbering was in use in 2017, Bottas probably would have run zero. The car was, for all intents and purposes, just an FW15C but modified to fit under the 1994 regulations. Williams redesigned the suspension and was for the first time in a while working with an analogue car. Newey also designed a lower part of the rear wing assembly that, like a few things in the aerodynamic world of motorsport, is borrowed from aviation. Heavy lift cargo aircraft such as the C5 Galaxy, the Airbus Atlas, the C130 Hercules and the AN225 have anhedral wings. Anhedral wings, anhedral wings pick and choose. These are wings that are lower at the tips than they are compared to the centerline of the aircraft. High performance fighter jets such as the F-16 Falcon have anhedral tail arrangements so that the wing wake over it is cleaner and makes the jet better for high angle of attack scenarios. Which when you're designing an air superiority fighter or a multi-role aircraft, that kind of thing is needed. In the case of heavy lift aircraft like the C-5 Galaxy, even the B-52 Bomber, it makes it so that this big ass plane can actually turn without a pendulum effect being induced, especially since these sorts of planes have high centres of mass with the heavy loads that they can be carrying. At least, that's how I understand it. In the FW16's case, this part of the wing was anhedral for a similar reason. 
As the air came over the rear of the car, it tidied up the airflow along the center line of the car, away from the rain light, and also at the tips where the air wasn't being messed up by the rear suspension. But when Damon and Ayrton went out in testing, they found the car twitchy and difficult to keep where they wanted it. And this was apparent at the Brazilian Grand Prix when Senna lost the rear at Junsao, which is Timo Glock Corner, and stalled the engine. For the second race in Japan, Nui stayed behind in Oxfordshire to work at the wind tunnel and figure out why the car wasn't working as intended. Nui worked out that it was some sort of stalling, either at the front or the rear, so the front wing or the diffuser. After the Pacific Grand Prix, Nui, a skeleton crew and Damon went to the Nogaro circuit in France, a bumpy circuit as it so happens to see what was what, and they observed Damon's car bouncing around like a pogo stick at about 150 miles an hour. The front wing on the FW16 at this point was very low to the ground and was very sensitive to ride height, so much so that it wouldn't require an actual ride height change to mess it all up. You had to just drive over a bump and the front wing would pick up way too much downforce and spin the car around, as both Hill and Senna found out in Japan. When Nui got back to the wind tunnel, he found that because the FW16 had long side pods, the ground effect was causing a highly averse pressure gradient that all added up with other things to cause the diffuser to have a very violent stall. So the rush began to redesign and rebuild the side pods to be smaller for Imola. The front nose assembly was made a little higher as well to try and balance the aero. Also at the San Marino Grand Prix, Senna had made requests to reduce his knuckles rubbing, which Williams did within the confines of what the FIA would allow. Williams couldn't lower the steering column, otherwise the FIA's test would deem it illegal, so instead they reduced the diameter of the column by 4mm. The car was also having more of a problem bouncing and being unstable at Imola than it did at either of the two previous Grand Prix, but still, Senna was able to put it on pole. During the race though, Senna's car was bottoming out hard through Tamborella Corner, which at that time was a long left-hander with no chicanes. Other drivers, including Hill, were going wider through there to try and keep the car stable. It wasn't just Williams running cars low to the ground. If you look at any of the cars of that time, they were as low as they could possibly get away with, and Senna's car was shooting sparks directly into Schumacher's face. Even on the lap of the accident that took Senna's life, the car was still showering Schumacher in superheated shards of carbon, before Schumacher's onboard footage shows the rear of the car step out and slam into the concrete wall on the exit of Tamborello. The modified steering column had been clearly snapped, but the big question was, did it snap in the corner, or when the car hit the wall? Now just as a disclaimer, this isn't a video on what killed Senna, and who is to blame, and all the myriad of theories that are out there that led to the accident. That's a video for another time, although at some point someone is bound to mention the yellow button. But there was one question on the engineers' minds. Why, at the time of the accident, was the car still bottoming out when the tyre pressure should have been back up to normal? because of that long safety car period behind that super slow Opel Vectra or whatever it was. But that said, one of the theories is that part of the diffuser stall issue became part of the accident. Car hits bump, rear steps out but suddenly grips back up and then car goes off into wall because driver can't correct it in time. But yeah, we'll leave it there because this video will go on a massive tangent otherwise. So in the aftermath of the three accidents, because we have to remember the other two, not just Senna's, the FIA brought in several knee-jerk changes to the construction of the cars. Engines were reduced from 3.5 litres to 3 litres. The airboxes above the driver's heads were reduced in size and changes were also made to the sizes of the front wings, diffusers and suspension assemblies, which were also made stronger. Williams in the interim managed to make the changes they wanted to make for Imola that never came shorter side pods and the introduction of barge boards for the Spanish Grand Prix, and this resulted in a car that was much easier to drive and Hill was finally able to get Williams a win on the board. Coincidentally and somewhat hauntingly, Senna had said that the car would be winning by then. By the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim, Williams had brought the FW16B that was a culmination of all the upgrades that had come since Imola. The car had a longer wheelbase and all the required modifications that were brought in to comply with the FIA's rash changes. Between Spain and Australia, Hill would only finish off the podium once, helped in part by external factors such as Schumacher's ban after Silverstone and his disqualification from the Belgian Grand Prix. But the FW16 is F1's example of even the best getting it wrong. Nui still to this day feels guilty about Imola and what happened because in his own words he screwed up the aerodynamics of the car. He says he messed up the transition from active to passive and then had a driver trying to do things in the car that it was not capable of doing. And with computer simulations and the way cars are designed today being way more accurate than back then, it was something that would probably have been avoided today, but 
no one will ever know. It also acts as a what if car. What if Senna had survived the crash at Imola and been around for when the thing was fixed? So then, a look at the Williams FW16. If you've learned something from this video, then do give it a like, and for more stuff from this channel, subscribe if you haven't already, and also get that bell on too, so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks to the supporters over at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help keep things running around here, then there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and everything else. Or the super thanks if you just want to do a one-off tip. So until next time, I've been Adam Ord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.